I met a gypsy. Ollie Bayless joins us on Gypsy Tales, the great man himself. What's going on, brother? Not a lot, just cruising around. Thanks for having me. Mate, thanks for helping me the other day. We uh, we went out to Norwell. Uh, the footage is coming soon, but you um, you coached me, got the knee down for a little scrape and uh, made my whole day, mate. It was funny, like, I wanted to just get out of there safe, not do anything silly, <laughs> and then, like, 20 minutes into that, it's like, oi, get your knee down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, so much changes when you're on the track. You know, you get in a rhythm, you have a bit of fun, and, yeah, I mean, I went in there. I asked you at the start of the day if you could if you've gotten your knee down yet, and sure enough, you haven't. So uh, that's what the goal for the day was, and yeah, we got it done. Yeah, it was a pretty, um, it was a pretty amazing feeling. Like, so I guess shout out to Alana for making it happen. Uh, one of the coolest things of this year was doing the Ducati thing for me, and it was like I left the track and I was, um, I was talking to a mate about the experience, and I was like, man, I feel like I fulfilled a dream I never knew I even had. Like I, I just. It was never, I never thought I'd be able to ride a Ducati. I never thought that I'd be able to do a track day and have a full set of leathers. It just wasn't on my bucket list at all. And then as soon as I did it, I was like, oh, this is, this is amazing. Like this, I've wanted to do this my whole life. I just didn't even realize it. Yeah. I mean, Alana was a big part behind it and Ducati as well. And yeah, they made the day possible and yeah, I had a ball, you know, giving you a few tips and seeing you progress throughout the day was the best part of it and yeah we got to do some wheelies stoppies get your knee down it was a bit of fun yeah so i'm uh I'm, i've been looking online like panigale v2s and like all right let's get one of these bad boys let's rip all the shit off it let's put some track tires on it chuck a wrap on it yeah that's it i mean any any bike nowadays is um they're just getting way easier to ride and how it is on track i mean half the electronics on all the bikes means you can't you know they're the, it's becoming more like a car where yeah you know you get sideways in a car and the car does its best to you know fit to fix itself up and get in a straight line it's the same thing on a bike really you can't wheelie it too far yeah you know traction control and all that it's all it's all just a helping hand and yeah all the bikes in the market now especially GKDs, the electronics are so strong and it's just the best because it's getting you ready for the track yeah even with the road bikes yeah yeah that's one of the things i noticed uh because it's that the so i had the hyper motard rv 950 um and that was the first bike because it's kind of like a bit of a dirt bike sort of position it's a yeah. motard but you know in like that classic ducati package and i don't have that much experience with road bikes before this bike and that was probably the thing that blew me away the most is just the way that the electronics are like between abs traction control wheelie control it just i was kind of scared going into it i was like fuck i'm gonna own this bike and it's gonna kill me but that's probably the biggest takeaway i think was i actually feel a lot safer on that bike than i thought i would if that makes sense yeah. like i think it's kind no, of like a saying. old school narrative of like you go oh, you're gonna ride bike <laughs> oh, yeah, good luck buddy <laughs> but i actually felt insanely safe on the thing yeah i mean that's how it is when i when i jump my race bike i mean these days the only really crashes that you can have is tuck in the front and you know once in a blue moon you'll have a high side and it's just from pretty much your own mistakes um like you can't you see a lot of the riders nowadays they don't have any more a lot of them don't have any more low sides and it's because their bike electronics are so good mm. you can't get on the gas too early because the electronics on the bike yeah they'll they'll give you a ride enough power to you know keep going on a smooth line and yeah it's progressing through pretty much all bike models now so yeah it makes it better for you know everyone to use it really does it make you trip out to think about the bikes that your dad used to race yeah i mean i've always asked the boys if i can have a ride on it with kind of all the electronics off and none of them are kind of keen on it just because really yeah how the bikes are these days the 1299 that jonesy rode that thing apparently was one of the loosest bikes you know around it was so fast and we turned wheelie control off and all that stuff and i never got to ride it which sucks a bit but you know from watching the bikes on how um dad used to ride them and even in bsb now in bsb now they don't run any electronics so no is that british super yeah 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 so no traction control really yeah nothing um so you know i give a big props to them boys because even now i get in a massive slide and pretty much shit myself so (laughs) yeah (laughs) um but yeah no all props go out to them and yeah how dad used to ride it even watch going back and watching the clips you can see the difference yeah 
Yeah. Yeah, we Rones, try and find we won't show on the TV, but just try and find like Troy Bayless clip. I wanna see just the the sketchiness that these things must have been <laughs> like. Because yeah, you think about like you know, those old what what was he on? Like five hundred two strokes and stuff back no, in the so day or? he wrote a two fifty two stroke and then when like in the two thousands or whenever they switched over to um four four Maybe four that second box. one but just not the just not the sound. Oh, that's a big crash. <laughs> Is that your old boy? Yeah. Silly bugger. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, he still rips too. He was out there with us the other day. But yeah, like from exactly what you're saying, like the, those bikes have the traction control and like the ABS and stuff is just so good. Yeah. That, you know, it kind of makes me scared to think of what, you know, like the old school bikes would have been like. Yeah. So what bike do you reckon, what bike would this have been? Uh, probably the two. That's the I think twelve nine nine. Actually no, eleven no ten ninety eight. That's the ten ninety eight. Yeah right. And that th- at that point it'd be all like that. Have pretty good electronics and stuff. Yeah, at there. this point I'm sure they'd have traction control. Definitely no wheelie control. I mean, Miller's the king at it now because the bike that I ride, you know, we've still got wheelie control and you can't really turn it off. Mm. And um. But yeah, I, I was speaking to Jack the other day and apparently you just leave it on and the bike's got like a biting point. If you rip it up hard enough, then you can get wheelie control to cut out. Really? So I, yeah, so I've tried multiple times and I can't do it and I've seen Miller do it and it, it shocks me because I've seen it. it on the on his Panigale that yeah, he rides? Yeah, on his um, yeah, MotoGP bike and even on the V4 yeah, that he tests yeah, on. Yeah, so what's the... So the bike that you race, so you're in the Australian Superbike, the like yep. big big boy class, yep. even though you're still a little tucker. <laughs> even though uh, a young pup. <laughs> um, what's that model and like what exactly are you riding? Shit, I always forget this. So I think I'm on the 1199 Ducati Panigale V4R. Yeah. And um, this compared to pretty much the World Superbike Ducatis is everything's the same except they can change stuff in the engine yeah they can lengthen the swing arms change the pivot of the swing arms change the angle that the kind of frame and forks sit at and we pretty much just have a stock motorcycle we Mm. can change the ecu change the suspension that's about it and then when it goes to motor gp it's a it's a whole different bike you can't buy them yeah um you know they change everything inside and out the swing arms now i think are even carbon fork cartridge uh the outside of the forks are probably carbon carbon brakes you know we can't do any of that so uh, like one day hopefully i get to have a rod on them it's um from what you see it's such a big difference and the lap times are so much faster so yeah yeah it should be good what what was the biggest um like i guess uh learning curve to adapt to to go from like a smaller bike to the bike that you're on now so from the 600s to i mean from 300s to 600s it's kind of the same different diff, i can't speak <laughs> former <Formal> week <mate. laughs> from the 300s to the 600s you know it, i felt like it was a big difference because i was still young i think i was going from 14 to 15 yeah and then from 600s to super bikes it was the same feeling as going from the 300s to 600s yeah right uh you know each time you step up it's just got a lot more power but from 600 to super bikes uh, my home track on the 600 was you know morgan park and i'd ride there as much as i could so probably twice a month three times a month yeah and i kind of got used to the track so when i got my first ride on the super bike it was at morgan park and i kind of didn't feel like it was going to be much of a difference but when i went there i like i couldn't unbelieve it it was feeling like the bike was riding me really i wasn't out of control but you know the bike would do a lot of things that it wanted to do and i couldn't really (laughs) i couldn't stop it from doing that so um yeah you get used to it and then when you went to a bigger track like phillip island it felt so much similar because it's so wide you know so wide and long and it just you know you can flow with the bike so much better than a track at say morgan park or wakefield park yeah it doesn't get upset over the bumps and yeah you can you really feel much more comfortable on the bike but after doing a lot of the a lot of track days and stuff at Morgan Park I've, I've finally gotten used to it and I can start you know going out when I want and going fast which yeah. is the, you know it's the main point of motorbikes really yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that that would be crazy a crazy transition to make like especially at your age like you're only you're 17 or 18, 18. so you're 18 yeah but it's like still 
super super young like i was even saying before you know it's like the week of the 18 year olds because jet was on here yeah you know there's so yeah. many kids that are especially kids that are from fathers of champions yeah. like yeah. you look at jack doing is you know i think he's only a year older than no well he was 18 last yeah, year 18 or 19 yeah so yeah. he's 19 this year um and then you got jet and then you got yourself and then you got remy like yeah it's a crazy wave of like young talent and dudes that are like stepping up earlier yeah. and earlier yeah yeah exactly i mean it's it's coming to the point where people are getting on the box at such a young age all the all the older guys are i don't know what i'm saying there where the fuck am i going with that <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it's getting to the point now where a lot of the younger guys are hopping onto the bigger box at a younger age than how it used to be i mean way back in a while ago it was you could jump on a you know a 600 or something yeah at the age of 25 and mm. to be honest people are still doing that because they've been riding that bike for so long mm. and they're comfortable on the bike and they can go fast with it but um yeah it's really time for the young guys to to start showing up and that's exactly what they're doing yeah because so your dad was what 10 years older than you when he first went to europe yeah yeah i think he would have been 20 something definitely late 20s i reckon yeah and um yeah so i'm at a good age now where you know we we had the chance to go to europe probably five years ago when i first started racing road racing and mum wasn't so keen on it just because you know i was still really young fair bit of un like inexperiencedness mm. and um so we decided to wait it out and then last year as well we got the chance to ride overseas again and you know at that point i had one year of school left so we weren't going to throw that away just in mm. case and i think that's an issue nowadays not an issue but a lot of the young kids are wanting to go over to europe and you know it's the same with the uk and all the other uh outside countries from mm. uh, europe and a lot of the kids at really young ages with a lot of inexperience yeah and, the, and they just don't want to like they not trying to just stay through the, like the school thing you know yeah. it's like there's such like a rush to to get to like moto gp or world superbike but i guess it's because it's so competitive now, yeah exactly right, you know exactly so the the moto three class i mean they can ride the bikes at such a young age or the red bull rookies and asia mm. talent cup that's the main main place where people are going and I, I agree on it like i mean it's such a good idea and people can ride at such a young age but it just wasn't the the right pathway for me i mean at 14 we could have gone over and done the red bull rookies and at that time i was kind of getting a bit taller a bit stronger than a lot of the other guys so you know we kind of didn't want to go that way and i'm really happy that we didn't at mm. this stage now because i've got the opportunity that i have and yeah i'm happy that i got onto the super bike at the young age i mean i think i was one of the youngest to get on at that point yeah and i mean it's paid off it really has i'm happy that i finished school Mum's happy i finished school and um yeah it's given me the opportunity that i'm at now and you know i can't be happier than it yeah so you look at guys like for in motocross for example you got like chad reed yeah and it's like he was at 16 years old racing 252 stroke winning supercrosses yeah in australia it's like he maxed out the bike it's yeah it's not like he stayed a junior and went through junior programs yeah exactly. Um, and then you know went to europe and did the same thing and then went to america so it's like i guess there is something to be said for staying in australia rising through the ranks getting on the big bike and being with the big boys and kind of getting that experience because it must be a pretty epic experience to be the youngest australian superbike race winner and you know like you you've picked some even though you're not in europe which is you know where a lot of guys yeah. want to just go straight away it's like it's not like you haven't been here kicking goals yeah i'm happy to tick tick a lot of the boxes that i mean that can get my name on them you know youngest race winner and although it's only a race it was kind of special in darwin because it's my first year riding the superbike and it just goes on but like sure if you can make you you can go overseas to europe and start winning like i respect that like, yeah i'm sure everyone will respect that and if you can make it work good on you but it wasn't the right decision for us to go over at such a young age and yeah. now we can go over you know i'll be 18 going over there dad will be coming over to help with me and i think it's just the right the right mindset and the right place to be you know i've got such a good team behind me barney racing and yeah i can't really couldn't ask for anything more really it takes a bit of confidence on your end i reckon 
to like back yourself a little bit because yeah. it's like you get FOMO, you know, like you're just yeah. watching everyone else over in Europe doing their thing and you know that you could be over there mixing it with those guys and it, you know, it takes a good bit of discipline and like mental strength to stay home, stay focused, stay on the grind. Yeah, the last two years have probably been the hardest just because we've hardly been racing in Australia and mm. everything in Europe is continuing to go no matter yeah, what, true, no eh? matter what really happens. I mean, in the last two years, I think I've got five or six ASBK races. Mm. So it's just like, you do feel like you're missing out heaps and that's made us have our decision to going overseas a fair bit more just because, you know, they are riding over there. They're mm. getting the track time and we're sitting out here getting a race like what, once every two to three months. So it's like, it's not the same as how they are and being here it's kind of like us and the desmo sport ducati team are struggling a little bit just because you know we can't we can't actually go racing and that's what we do Mm. so i mean made it easier for me to finish school i guess that's one positive you can take out of it yeah but now we're going overseas i mean we'll be going over there late january probably and riding once a week we hope <laughs> yeah that'd be pretty crazy because i think with the the road bike thing i know when i was like loading up the the rv in the back of the van i was like this is a trip like <laughs> putting a road bike like something i ride on the road in the back of the van and so like it's not as easy as just you know going to qmp on, yeah, on a exactly. thursday morning exactly you can't just pack the bike in the van and expect to expect everything to go good you need to bring tires you know it's a bit harder than motocross and if it was easier it wouldn't be the same yeah yeah that's so true <laughs> it's half the experience well i think too probably one of the cool things about staying home the last couple of years and like kind of following this path that you're on is like a relationship with the factory yeah because you know, obviously the structure of ducati changed behind the scenes in australia and now they've got their program and for you to be such a young kid with like factory support working direct with yeah. you know not and it's not just like the race team it's like you're working direct with Ducati Australia and yeah. like marketing and so there's a lot in that I think in like your personal development too and I'm, I'm pretty sure that will play a fairly important role in your career going forward too you'd think yeah exactly I mean Ducati they're they're starting to give me a lot, a lot of opportunities you know just with things that we do like going to Norwell with you they've got some let's see do you know about the simulators Nah. Oh, okay. Well, Ducati have got some simulators. I don't know if I can talk about it or not. That's the only thing. That's all right. We'll just cut it out if we can't. <laughs> but um, yeah, Ducati are, are giving me a lot of opportunities going, you know, to Norwell, helping people ride out. And yeah, there's a lot of things coming in the future that, you know, will will give me a hand. And it's good because they're giving a lot, a lot of opportunities for young people to get involved in the sport, which is good. Yeah. And um, yeah, me being pretty direct to Ducati Australia it's giving me a lot of cool experiences and showing me really into the real world which is cool yeah and then i think you know obviously like your goals going forward is going to be to like get a factory ride and to be on factory teams yeah you know to have that experience of like oh i've played this game before like I, i understand what they want from me i understand what i need to deliver to be the good spon you know a good sponsored athlete because these days too you know like it's sort of just not about race wins anymore it's yeah, it's yeah. a kind of a big overall package and i think to have that relationship now to have your headspace in around that is um that's going to be like a good thing long term and you probably don't get that going a more traditional route yeah exactly i mean it's good because i grew up with a lot of the ducati mechanics and uh bosses that dad had when he was racing mm. and a lot of them are still in the scene at the moment which is going to be really good for me and they're going to be able to help me out uh the only issue that i'm going to have going over there is that i can't speak any italian <laughs> so i'm going to have to start learning that and Ali, he speaks the third least italian <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i gotta i gotta learn that so i can you know communicate pretty well over there i think all you need to know is grazie rossi <laughs> yeah grazie rossi ciao rossi <laughs> <laughs> that's all you, that's the only italian yeah. you need to know <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. And the I guess the other thing too is just like uh, the last name on the jersey too. Like that's going to come with some good and some bad probably. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a hard topic because a lot of the people that have helped me out have helped me out because of the Bayless name. A lot of the people that have helped me out have helped me out because I can ride good. And then 
then comes into the things where people believe it's only just a name mm. and it'll be good it'll be good to show them that it's you know not just a name and that i can prove a point which is you know a big thing because from when i started racing i guess not necessarily dirt bikes but when i started racing road racing a lot of it was you know people thought it was just because of the name and mm. i'm getting the opportunities that i've gotten because you know just because of the name and it's been good on the 300s and 600s i proved that it was more than that and hopefully this year i've done it and then next year as well it'll be good you know that to prove to the people that believe that that um it's more than that and yeah hopefully it will be done i think it will be but yeah it'll be good to show them what's up yeah because it's always uh it's one of those things you're just never going to get away from yeah exactly you know? so i think feel like it's a narrative that you kind of can control um in a way by just yeah the way that you talk about it and the way that you kind of deal with it but i think winning races is the thing that yeah fi- fixes all that yeah exactly um, but it's still still a thing to you know deal with as a i guess as a kid uh i'm, I'm sure it probably was worse when you were younger yeah than like bit. nowadays right? mainly to when i started but you know i got a little bit when everyone kind of found out i was racing with barney but it's good i kind of like it and it's going to sound so cliche but it just helps you fuel yeah it, yeah it, it fuels you up a little bit more it gets that little bit out of you not necessarily anger it just wants you to push a little bit more which is good and i think you know if you don't have any negative uh comments and stuff on your social media then you know it's kind of you're not well, doing good enough yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah exactly. and you two are so competitive so i feel like even just from being around you guys the other day um at the track like you could see the competitive nature and like your old boy still is mountain biking well he got slowed down a little yeah, bit yeah he got slowed down crash. a little bit but he's still going but it's like you can see how competitive you two were and it's like i mean I, i'm sure that i'm sure that of all the people that have ever given you shit about your dad being troy bayless <laughs> your dad has probably given you the most shit yeah. about your dad being troy <laughs> bayless. i mean it's it's funny as everything that we do is a competition and it's great i love it to be honest i wouldn't want it any other way because it's so good for what i do mm. but we make it in a in a fun way like i mean far out we go home the first competition is um wayne's so whoever's the lightest you damn you win that one then we'll go to the cart track whoever's the fastest which is me <laughs> every time we go there now i smoke him but um yeah it's it's funny because the main training that i do with him now is um like surf skiing like a paddle in the yeah, yeah. in the river and yeah. you know we're always doing efforts out there to try and show each other who's the faster one but uh, I got a bit more strength, and he's got a bit more endurance, so it's fu- it's cool, it's fun. And was it always like that with him? A little bit less when I started off, because um, I think he didn't want to feel really pressure me into it, mm. which is good. And I don't feel pressured into it now at all because this is what I want to do. But um, I think he just wanted to take it a bit steady when I first started racing, and then after the past couple of years, everything turned into a competition. I mean, when we rode the six hundreds. He decided to jump on one as well, and we'd go around Morgan Park battling it out. And now, because he can't really ride the Ducati V4R, we kind of just go to the kart track on the 400s and just smash it out with each other. We're always passing each other, always having a battle. It's good fun. Yeah, that must be pretty cool. And and for yeah, I think for for him to like not push too hard at the start because like that's probably when it's the most fragile with a kid. And yeah, then exactly. It's probably when you've got like the least experience with like dealing with the fact yeah. that oh my dad is a three-time world champ my dad is a fucking man yeah like that's probably the move to just let it kind of do its thing yeah exactly that's the that's the main thing really you know not being pressured into it too much i know he, i know that he wanted me to do it and in dirt bikes to be honest i had a, a bit of a rough time in between dirt bikes and road race and i kind of didn't get sick of it i was just you know sick of the whole concept about me being a bailiff and racing motorbikes mm. and it kind of it got to the point where i was almost getting on top of me so i kind of had a little bit of a break and then dad asked if i wanted to have a ride on the uh, metric at 70 i think it was and i was like yeah yeah i'll go have a practice on it not thinking really anything about it and then once i jumped on it i just fell in love with road racing really you know from then that's when it all started and you know even the the crashes and stuff it just makes you want you to get on and go faster again so but yeah it's good so what were you racing like motocross or dirt track or dirt track dirt yeah. track mainly we started mainly oil track 
that's yep. where I on the dirt I suffered a little bit but when it came to oil you know you had more grip um, is where I started to go really like pretty fast and um, so yeah I think that's where I kind of got my road racing background was from the oil track on the dirt box yeah and then that was where it kind of felt a bit like ah fuck this is a lot like being a bailiff and rocking up to the track and because it's like you'd never for me when i was a kid you just pull into the pits no one knows who you are you yeah unload exactly. your bike you go on the track no one cares <laughs> and then you go home but yeah for you you'd be like this young kid that would have all these people watching you just purely because of who your dad was like there yeah. just would be no like anonymity in there at all yeah exactly it feels like you know sometimes it felt like you were only doing it because of that reason mm. and um it's good because i've realized throughout the years that i actually like this sport i love this sport and um this is what i want to do for the rest of my life so yeah so when you were young you lived in monaco with your old boy didn't you for like the first few years yeah and you pretty much just like grew up on the circuit while your dad was doing it yeah pretty much so i um at the time mum and dad were living in monaco with my brother and sister and uh boom there i came along so from there i think dad had another five years where he was racing motorbikes and that's where we lived in monaco so i was raised in monaco for five years and then we moved back to oz and Yes. So you're a monogast. I'm a monogast. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, it was good just, you know, spending time around the team and getting used to the, I think that's where a lot of the racing background came from, just growing up and I was always around bikes. Do you remember much of it? No, nothing. Yeah. I wish I did. Be I cool, wish, huh? Yeah, I really wish I did. I remember a couple of stories here and there when my hair used to get dyed, you yeah. know, at the racetrack by my cousins and stuff, but... I wish I could remember more about how the atmosphere was. Yeah. And it's good to, you know, you go to Phillip Island or something when the World Strip Bikes are there and it kind of comes back to you a little bit. Yeah. But you don't get the full story. So hopefully in a couple of years I can I can feel that, feel how the atmosphere used to be. Yeah, yeah. So you get on the, what, what was the name of the bike? Or what what do they look like? Well, the first bike that you got, the road one. Oh, uh, Metric at 70. Metric at 70. I want to see what they look like. Ah. Uh, a, I think K-I-K, 70. Hope it comes up. Go to images. Oh, sick. Yeah. Yeah, they're cool. Mine wasn't kitted up like that. I think, actually, yeah, mine was yellow at the time. Yeah, So right. the one just left to that on the... Yeah, there you go. That's the beast. <laughs> so that was where it all started. That's where it all started. So, what do you think that it was about the road racing as opposed to, like, the oil track or flat track that just got got you in? I don't... Honestly, I don't really know. Um, I had no intentions of it. I never even really thought about it. And then when Dad asked if I wanted to hop on one at, the, I think it was Lakeside Kart Track, I said, yeah, sure, why not? And, you know, didn't really expect anything out of the day and had a ride got my knee down and you know that's where it first started really mm. i realized this is there's more to it than what i thought at the time i think i was only 11 or something yeah 10 or 11 and um yeah so after i jumped on one of them you know we quickly quickly progressed up through the years and went they went 300 600 then super box that's so sick so what's yeah. the what's the next bike you ride after that a 300 yeah kawasaki 300 yeah let's look at one of those bad boys because yeah like all this is just so new to me like i just always thought that this whole world of road racing and road bikes was just so inaccessible like to you know and <laughs> yeah. I, you don't even think about there's like you know that 70 and then what yeah, the bikes exactly. are you sort of just don't really know but after doing the you know the track day with you i was like man this is actually sick like yeah. i feel like a lot of people could get into this a little bit obviously pretty expensive yeah. but it's not this impossible thing that no, i kind no, of no. thought it was you know yeah it's kind of honestly it's kind of like the um motocross background you start on a 50 i guess yeah start on a 50 in road racing you kind of start on a metric at 70 yeah and then what do you go to from a 50 85 small wheel or something yeah yeah, yeah it's kind of like going to a 300 and then you know you go to a 125 it's like going to a 400 on a yeah um and then yeah it kind of steps up 250 i'm guessing would be kind of like a 600 yeah and then 450 is like super bike. so it's kind of the same background yeah and the concept of it all is really close yeah 
which is why I think I got to learning it pretty quickly because that's what I did on dirt bikes. So, um, yeah, it kind of just felt a little bit normal. Yeah. And then once I jumped on the road bike, I found out that, yeah, you know, this, this feels right, kind of feels like home. So, yeah. yeah, that's the route I've gone. And so, for like for me, uh, I'm a guy that likes to just, I like technique and I like repetition. Yeah. And the the I'm not like a send it kind of guy. Yeah. I feel like I'm way more of a like just do it until I get it right kind of thing. Yeah. Motocross always felt like real send it yeah. to me. Yeah. You know, I was just like, fuck it, hold it on through all the bumps and just be like a savage. I'm like, well, I'm just not kind of that savage. <laughs> but then on the road bike, it felt, I mean, I did a lot of laps that first day i mean i think i I probably did like over 100 k's worth yeah. of riding yeah, on that that day yeah and like and i think it's like a 2.2 k track and it was yeah. like 140 something k's yeah. so it's like it's 70 odd laps you know yeah and it just was so like addictive to just try because the corners are the same the track yeah, stays exactly. the same but it's like you get to be just like these tiny little like increments yeah exactly. different so to me I really enjoyed like that that played that played into like my I guess the shit that I enjoy about yeah. you know motocross or whatever yeah. so yeah I can sort of see that you could lean it's the same feeling you know like you're behind bars yeah but I could see how one person could lean more towards the road side and another person could lean more towards the moto side because I feel like with the road racing stuff, you kind of just, you can't do it unless you're doing it the right way. Yeah. In a sense. Whereas motocross, you still kind of can. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. I mean, with road racing, you kind of have to have the right form. Yeah. And you have to know, really, you have to know a lot of the stuff that's going on to to be able to go pretty fast. And with road racing, I guess you can, you can be the sketchiest rider out there, but you can still be pretty fast. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'm kind of the same as you with the whole send it thing on road racing. Yeah, it's exactly what you said. And then when it comes to motocross, I mean, I rode dirt bikes for five years or something. I go and ride motocross. I can't do a triple. I can't yeah. do a triple. I can't go over whoops. I mean, I can go through the corners pretty fast, but far out. Like, if you see me going over whoops or a jump, I'm just like, what do they call it? A dead sailor? Well, I saw the thing you posted the other day. Oh, that's yeah. You. <laughs> yeah. That's me. <laughs> I had a good laugh. I actually, did you see that? I actually thought it was Ollie and I was like, fuck, that was massive. And then I like actually looked and I'm like, okay, that wasn't actually In all Ollie. honesty, I got a bit, of, got in a bit of trouble out of that because a lot of the people thought it was me. And yeah, I fully did too. Probably some of the people that shouldn't have seen it did think it was me and they got a bit worried about it so uh yeah i got a bit of a roasting for that one but no, uh, you're too busy high side yeah i'm too too busy high side and road racing bikes <laughs> yeah but um yeah i could kind of just see the way that the mindset to be a good road racer would be like a little bit different in a sense but then i'm sure that the the deeper that you get into it the more room there is to like be that kind of like send it yeah, sort exactly. of dude I'm, I'm sure it does kind of change but I think just the fact that it's like you've got this same circuit that really doesn't change and it, the variable is you and your bike as opposed to like you and the track and all the other sort of yeah, things exactly. that are going on yeah, yeah a- and you're not like mate, waiting on like moisture in the track and yeah. things like that as well that's a good part about it I guess the closest thing that we're getting to moisture on the track is maybe a bit of dust on the track so we get pretty mm. lucky we get lucky because it's not like you get you know a new rut or something like what people in motocross or supercross see which um i guess is a good part of it and i wouldn't say it's less physical but mm. you get a different uh, yeah it's different i can't explain it and i i wish i could but you know people see road racing is you just you, you know you're just going around in circles can't be that physical but like when i'm riding a a V4 at uh, Morgan Park, say, feels like you're doing a, mm. a workout in the gym. I mean, it's you can't explain it because there's so many things going on, but it is it is tough. It's it's hard. Well, the thing that... So I noticed a few things. Um, my hands got pretty sore, yep. which my I'm pretty good with my hands just from jiu-jitsu, so yep. like I don't really struggle with that in motocross that much. Yep. Um, so my hands still got fairly sore i was like oh shit okay yeah. um and mentally i was done <laughs> like i went home from that day 
Jackson ended up driving the van home. I was smoked, dude. And I'm just like a vegetable just sitting there like... But I could feel there were a couple of times where I did like longer rides. Yeah. And I pulled off and was just fried. I was like, physically, I could have kept riding. Yeah. But I was like, I'm going to make a mistake here because like I'm just not concentrating yeah. as much. So I think that there's got to be something to just the speed that you're going and like how much information you've got to process at the at the same time yeah i think that's the thing it's just going fast and then having the quick reflexes to do, to do the little movements that you have to do i mean i've done a couple of endurance races and by the end of that you're just completely done and then even after a good two days of um open track testing after a good two days of open track testing it's just like you are just so done especially in the heat the heat really mm. takes it out of you because you're on the tar you're in a you're in your leathers and stuff and yeah you're always sweating and um it's honestly like doing a big two days of working out yeah yeah that's the other thing i noticed too was i felt really dehydrated yeah from just sweating so much in the leathers yeah you just got to make sure to drink water hydrolytes everything you know eat eat good don't eat too much if you eat dad's always told me if you eat too much on race day you go slow yeah so um yeah, as long as you drink a lot of water and keep your hydrolytes and all that stuff up, then, yeah, you should be pretty good. The um, the other thing that I noticed as well um, is that, like, the inside of my leg oh. got so cool. It doesn't matter. It doesn't – nothing will fix that. Really? Yeah, after a race weekend, you, like, your hip flexors and the inside of your leg are always going to be sore. Yeah. And I don't know if it happens to other riders, but it happens to me as well. So don't feel alone on that one. Oh, man, because, like, there was um, – the at the end when we were, like, really trying to ride and, and get yeah. my knee down, I was like, man, I'm fucked. Like, my, <laughs> the, I know I could what I could do, but, like, because – for anyone that I guess hasn't ridden it, this is like my crude description of turning a road bike, which I actually had no idea this is how it worked. Yeah. So like, oh, how about you explain how the corners work and then I'll explain what I was feeling. Well, it's weird. You think, you know, it's it's kind of like a motocross bike because the more you lean it over, the more you're going to turn. But I mean, if you're riding a road bike pretty steady, just like say through a car park or anything, the turning circle on it is horrible. Mm. You cannot turn it, no matter what bike it is, you just can't turn the thing, you know, probably 45 degrees. So, um, yeah, when you're coming into a corner, if you brake good enough, then you kind of hold speed and you lean off the bike enough and it just depends on how much you do lean off the bike, how easy it is going to be to turn. Yeah, so pretty much like you're coming into the turn and I was like you know you stay central and like lean with it but what you're kind of trying to do is essentially just getting all your weight off to the side and almost leaning the bike as little as possible but you lean as much as you can and then the bike just kind of follows you around yeah exactly and then all the weight essentially from your entire body is from your knee and thigh against like the gas tank in the frame yeah and you're just like hanging off like there's not that much weight in your hands no and you're trying to get essentially it's like you're trying to get your chin bar of your helmet to the inside of your handlebar so it's like road head handlebar and then and then you're hanging your ass cheek off the um bike as much as you can so i actually went after we did the track day i actually like uh googled some like physics experiments of like oh, yeah. of how they I was like the physics behind a motor GP bike <laughs> turning and there's actually like it there's an experiment can you just google that like how does a moto GP bike turn it's, it's pretty interesting but um basically it's like the it shows how the centrifugal force works yep. so like as you're um spinning it then the it goes this way the force is actually going that way so yeah, the bike right. the force from the bike is trying to go the opposite direction to yep. where you're turning so that's why you've got to lean so much off the motorcycle yeah that makes sense look at these psychos you're one of these psychos <laughs> but yeah the the way that the hips have to swing is um you th- you feel like you're doing a lot well you feel like you're doing it more than you actually are like when you yeah. look at footage and stuff yeah but then i noticed like looking at footage of, of yours you're just like throwing your hips around oh like, yeah as much as you can um this isn't the oh wait up uh, i'm just watching this video real quick Nah, there's another one go back rooms um keep going Nah, maybe go up a bit again so go to that third one. I 
I love the terminology. How do MotoGP <laughs> riders bend so much without falling? <laughs> yeah, there was like a there was like a cool video that I I watched on it. But yeah, basically, it's all about the way that centrifugal force is created as you yep. lean in the the actual um the bike, bike wants to wants go, to the, go other the other way so that's why you've got to kind of yeah um, yeah go off it it was funny i was talking to todd waters um and oh here we go getting into it here now so yeah vector of force <laughs> we're getting all technical in here so yeah this is this be interesting for you to watch mate this yeah. is what you do I'm yeah so the centrifugal force is pushing against uh the way that you're trying to lean the bike so the more that uh the more like the more speed that you go the more force is created so the the more force yeah. going that way so then you've got to compensate so that's how those things stick to the ground because yeah like and dude did you see the video casey posted on his instagram oh, yeah what did you see that <laughs> casey's on her instagram right now it is it was absolutely pretty cool. psychopathic <laughs> like i just don't understand it but when you look into i guess like the the physics side of it nice little first uh image <laughs> there. shout out to flick palms here <laughs> yeah got one in the middle watch this shit like what is doing right now <laughs> like are you serious yeah that looks fake dude <laughs> It was a good slide. It was a real good slide. Both wheels sliding ridiculously fast. He's just tucked in and ready to rip. Fellow Ducati rider, mate. <laughs> it's actually, it's cool. A lot of the riders in Australia are starting to go like kind of the route that he's going in. Like Brock Pearson, who races in the 600 class, he's um he's really starting to two-wheel slide the bike and he does it so much and really when i was racing 600s the only passes he would do on me were the ones where both wheels were sliding and it annoyed the absolute shit out of me because i couldn't do it i can like i can slide the rear wheel and on the 400 i could slide the front wheel but um yeah it's loose and so many riders are going down that path where you know they're just smooth but it doesn't look like they're in control but they are yeah so it's cool it's cool it's really cool to look at how would you even do that I don't know. I mean, I think that's turn three at Valencia. Yeah. And a lot of the corners do set you up for it. Like, it's a fast left-hand corner that kind of finishes off pretty quickly. Yeah. So, um, they do help. It's a bit like turn three at Phillip Island, named after Casey. Yeah. Um, where you're pretty much almost flat out, and the thing is just absolutely hanging it wide. And it's so cool. If you have a good photographer or a good videographer there, I mean, it, it shows the coolest shots that you can possibly get yeah yeah no it, it it's insane and the the physics behind him and i think after yeah when i got home and i started watching the the videos i was like oh that kind of makes sense because i mean you can you can see like the difference in like obviously the way that you're leaning versus me and i'm feeling like dude this is sketchy you know but there's <laughs> yeah. so much grip on yeah. those bikes that yeah, it's exactly. like it's actually doesn't make sense no i mean it's once you're on a on a cart truck and stuff you realize how much grip you actually have like you can lean the bikes over so much and you can get so close to the ground and a lot of the times you're not going to fall because the front and rear wheel are so close to you know falling off the edge of the tire like Mm. it's almost never like once in a blue moon it'll ever happen and that's why so many riders these days are you know scraping their elbows and sometimes if they turn their head enough they can scrape their head and it's just like the bikes and tires it's going so much in a positive way that they do have that much grip and they can lean them over so much so is that what you think's happening is that the bikes and the tires are just getting so much better yeah definitely um i mean if you look back to when dad was riding or even a little bit before the riders are so crossed up on the bike like the bike's going this way and although the riders ass and knees are on this side of the bike they're leaning so much the opposite way and it's just weird how much the you know how much we different the riders look while they're yeah. riding the bike i mean it's the complete opposite yeah the the riders are leaning so much to where the bike is turning and stuff nowadays to how it was you know in the 90s 80s and before then yeah so um i think rossi and a lot of Ruben's house, a lot of the riders that started kind of the elbow on the ground technique. And even Dad, still to this day, doesn't like doing it. We'll go on the cart track and he's just like, he looks like so crossed up. It just doesn't look right. 
because of how people are riding them these days yeah so you think it's like also just like a as the technique and well i guess it's probably the bikes and the rider yeah the every, riders like working together to evolve at the same time yeah exactly there's so much physics and science behind everything these days you know all the gp guys and gp bikes they they go into wind tunnels and they test all this stuff the test which is the fastest and yeah i, I think it's come across that you know leaning off the bike as much as you can is the fastest way to go around the track it's just still doesn't make sense when you're doing it though. <laughs> <laughs> and you can just lean and lean and lean yeah you honestly can it's like you get a good enough corner and you do feel like you can almost get your head on the ground because you can lean off the bike so much and so the monster that you rode at, at norwell so that's the bike that i'm getting next yep what's the like I guess the differences to a bike like that to say um, like your race bike in terms of grip and that sort of thing like I mean on the they're a different thing obviously yeah, so it's not like they're trying to be the same but they're pretty different it's just I think the big one of the biggest things was the tyres because now I'm used to you know slick tyres and I don't think they make that much of a difference but we got tyre worms and everything We when we went to Norwell we just had you know tyres that you would have got off like that you can ride on the road with yeah 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 and no tire warmers and i think you know if i may have got two two days on the bike i reckon i could probably get my elbow down but um yeah it's just you feel so much more comfortable on a bike that's set up right and that's the other that's the other thing if you know if if the bike's not set up right then you're going to feel really uncomfortable and you won't be able to ride it that so fast what what sort of setup stuff are you chasing to feel comfortable mainly just suspension yeah you like the first thing that you do when you go to a track is set out the gearing yeah and then from then you just mess with the suspension and that's about it really what what sort of suspension stuff do you do on like a normal day uh just you know once once you get a good feeling around the track and you have a, a suspension setup that you feel comfortable and you don't have to change it much yeah to for either track that you go to but um if you're still struggling to find setup we mainly just look for you know stuff in the uh, front suspension like you know putting heavier springs in or yeah. changing the rebound changing the compression and it's the same with the rear except we we mainly just play with the uh, spring rates on the rear yeah is sag a big thing in in road racing like a little bit but you kind of just once you get the sag right at one truck it pretty much stays the same yeah right what sag does a, a bike run i got no idea <sighs> i got no idea what are we doing here mate you're supposed to know all this nerd shit don't you know i'm a nerd <laughs> i don't know any of this nerd shit i just know uh how heavy my springs are that's it yeah okay you just need to know basis yeah can you tell when stuff's out like yeah. it, it, do you put a lot of effort into understanding testing because you know you look at um there's a bunch of different ways to skin a cat yeah so you got a guy like jack yeah don't really give a fuck yeah guy like casey could probably build a MotoGP bike out yeah. of Lego. I think I'm somewhere probably in between him. I mean, when when something's wrong with the bike, I well, I don't really feel comfortable on it. But if I have to ride it like that, I um I will. And that's a big thing that Dad's taught me while riding at the car track. He makes me switch between my 400 and his 400 because they're yeah. I wouldn't say they're completely different, but they've got different setups in them, and one's different enough. One's a lot higher than the other one, so um he gets me to ride both of them because he's gone fast on the one that he mainly rides and i've gone mm. fast on the one i mainly ride so if i can do a pretty close time on both of the bikes and i'm pretty happy so um, has, has your old boy is he pretty hands-on with like you in terms of is he almost like a coach slash trainer kind of thing uh definitely used to be he what is it? I can't speak English. Uh, yeah, like he definitely... Hey, it's formal work. It's formal You're not supposed to be able to speak English. I can't believe you're here. Um, but no, I mean, he he used to be a lot more hands-on than he is now. Um, he used to, you know, kind of... I wouldn't say teach me how to ride, but just give me a helping hand. Like he'd come out on track with me. And when I first started, he'd um, come out on track with me and show me all the lines and all that. Yeah. And um, now it's kind of come to the point where he's wouldn't say a crew chief but he kind of takes all the information that i get out mm. on track and kind of helps uh you know the mechanics that i have around me with what to do which is good because it comes from all the experience that he's had throughout the years which is one thing that you know i don't think i would have learnt with just a couple years of experience yeah yeah which is good because 
you know, it's weird. Motorbike riders, they kind of have their own language when they come in from the pits. Yeah, like, yeah. They, like, I, like, I know I say the most random stuff and it's good because dad can, like, he's translate like a it. translator. Yeah, he's like a translator. He can say it to all the mechanics and, you know, he understands it, which is really good. So, when, when you're young, like, that's one of the things, being a kid, you never really want to listen to what your dad says yeah. and you'd rather hear it from someone else. Did you ever have any of that or like have you guys uh, because you you two seem like you get on really good. Yeah, we do. Um the worst was probably when he was racing like he came back to Australian Superbikes and I was racing the 300s as well cuz we were both stressed obviously. Yeah. We were both riding, racing motorbikes and he'd come and you know tell me what to do, not tell me what to do but try and give me a hand and you know me as a young teenager. Yeah. You know young teenagers don't like listening to their parents a bit. And um, so, yeah, I guess I kind of was a little shit to, to him when he was racing as well. And um, throughout the years, it's just kind of formed. Like if he's got an opinion and saying, we'll try that. Yeah. If it doesn't work, okay, it doesn't work. We're not going to try that again. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, I mean, everyone in the team's got to say they can, if they've got an idea on what to do with setup, then yeah, well, I mean, we're always happy to try it to go faster, which is good Why when we go to Morgan Park because we're, we're pretty much at the limit now you know you just have to do fine tweaks to to try and go that little bit faster yeah 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 because so many kids are just if they if they hear it come from the dad like your dad can say something and then you be like fuck off dad <laughs> and then like someone you know you could ben or someone says the exact same thing you're like yeah 100 percent. we should definitely <laughs> do that yeah it's weird it, i think everyone's kind of the same a little bit but you know, I'm happy I'm out of that stage now and yeah. everything that dad kind of says to me has a meaning behind it. Yeah. And obviously when I was 12 or 13, you know, I didn't really think much of it. Yeah. When did you realize, or like, do you remember the first time that you realized that your dad was like a famous racer? Like, do you remember having those kind of thoughts and being like, ah, that's what's going on? Not really the, the memory behind it. It's probably just when I started, maybe say 2015, I knew beforehand, but I couldn't really remember a lot of it. Yeah. And then in 2015, I think I was like 13 or 12, 12 or 13, he um, went and did the debut. Well, not a debut. He went and uh, raced World Superbikes at Phillip Island and then in Thailand. Yeah. And I was lucky enough to go to the Phillip Island one. And that's when I kind of realized, you know, a bit of who he is and how big of a deal he, um, he is. So, yeah, it was cool. Must have, it must be a bit of a trip to sort of think that because it'd be so normal to you yeah yeah it, it is really normal to me nowadays because I understand and I realise you know it's the same for a, a lot of the other legends that have raced uh, World Superbikes on MotoGP yeah and um, it's cool just going back to Phillip Island and the atmosphere it just feels like home I guess do you enjoy that track? Phillip Island? yeah yeah I love it I um you know, I've had a win there oh, on sick. every on every bike I've raced, which is good. Really, and it's it's really coincidentally every time my um, the World Superbike or MotoGP guys go there, I'll have a win. Yeah, so right. you know, I win at the right time when we go there, which is good. But um, yeah, you also have some of the biggest crashes really? at Phillip Island. Oh, massive! Because really? it's such a fast track, and most of the time, every time you do have a crash there, it's deep gravel trap and fast corners. You um you're kind of crashing knowing that you're not going to be able to ride your bike away because yeah. the gravel truck just tears it apart which you know it sucks to crash yeah, it sucks to crash anywhere but it just hurts a little bit more there because you know and that you're not going to be able to ride your bike back to the pits or anything yeah that's like the walk of shame after <laughs> yeah, that. it is the walk of shame <laughs> <laughs> that's so good i have had one crash on a road bike <laughs> don't want to do it ever again no nah, it, it's not fun no it was terrible it was fucking traumatic to be honest <laughs> we're in vietnam oh, riding these they're like these 150 fucking life and things and it, <laughs> it had just rained and we're in like this vietnamese range and i was coming down the hill and there was must have been diesel or something i'm just leaning and then <laughs> the front went and like it went so fast i didn't even have time to put my hands off the like take my hands off the bars <laughs> And put my hands down or anything, so I just face planted. I'm oh. so lucky I had a full face helmet on. And then I hit my shoulder, my shoulder popped out forwards. Oh. And then I just slid across the road <laughs> into this ditch like it was fucking hectic. And like the sound of that big bike just going, 
driver. <laughs> like, scraping across the road. And then, like, the echo in my helmet of, the of like, my face being on the concrete. I was just like, holy shit, that is so gnarly. Yeah. So, like, when we were at Norwell, I was just like, don't fucking crash this bike. I'm so over it. Yeah, crashing a road bike sucks. But it's weird. Normally, the, the faster the crashes you have, the the easier it is to walk away from it and the less sore you are just because you kind of just, you know, guess scrape along the ground is the best way of putting it. I mean, you'll get, maybe you'll get a burn rash here and then, but when you have a slow crash, you kind of just hit the ground. Get stuck. And, and stay tumble. on the ground. Yeah. And stay on the ground. It's like as far as having a fast crash and sliding goes. So a lot of the road racers would rather have a fast crash than a slow one. Yeah, yeah, it, it makes sense, but I mean, just for me these days, I just don't know that I want to do it. No, nah, crashing sucks. <laughs> you don't want to crash. Have no you, one wants to crash. Have you had a bunch of them? Like, do you feel like you kind of figure, because I'd say like, uh, for me, my goal would be like not to crash again, but <laughs> it's like if I go buy a, like a Panigale V2 or something and start doing some track days, you probably got to expect that you're going to put it down at some point. Yeah, I mean it's good now i've had the experience that i have you kind of know where your limit is yeah and a lot of pretty i mean most people that like race road bikes now know where their limit is and the crashes that you have is most of the time from just trying to put a bit of an extra lap in or Mm. once in a blue moon you'll just have a silly crash and like like a lot of common ones is running off like going into a corner too hot and you'll just drop the bike a little bit in the gravel trap which is fine yeah and then yeah a lot of like main ones people have these days is just tucking the front and it's just from pushing too hard or yeah. hitting an unlucky bump or something. Yeah, yeah, I just don't want a bar of it, eh? No, it's don't pretty, want a bar of it. Pretty, pretty traumatic. Yeah, when you, crashing you hear sucks. the bikes and the, just everything sucks. sliding and grinding. <laughs> you're just thinking, fuck, how much money did I just throw <laughs> down the road? That's what everyone was like tripping out about because I, I don't think there's many of those RVEs in the country like no. that special edition one no and everyone's like be careful I'm like trust me <laughs> I'm being careful I'm very careful <laughs> but it goes out the window when you start yeah it does everything that you you say beforehand kind of goes does go out the window go out the window while you're on track yeah I will say though it felt very safe yeah like I didn't really feel I actually was pretty nervous for it to be honest yeah like I was nervous obviously that we were filming it and that there was people watching and that yeah. you guys were going to be there like I didn't really get nervous to ride motocross ever yeah but I think too I just didn't really know what to expect yeah. and I thought it not to say it was easy but I thought it would be harder yeah but it really wasn't like a hard thing no. to do like you could go you can enjoy it and and I I feel like I could enjoy that as much as what well, I mean I said to you guys I was probably one of my best two-wheeled experiences of all time and that yeah. that's true you know like I enjoyed that track day as much as I've enjoyed any motocross yeah, yeah. day and I think it's because you can go there there's no jumps there's no whoops there's no yeah like exactly. you know I go to some tracks I'm like oh, I'm not doing that yeah so then every lap you've got to roll this one thing that's like yeah. you know staring at you the whole time you never really get <laughs> like the good flow going whereas you know on the road bike it's like i said it's just always the same it's there yeah, exactly. and it's kind of just those little you know you're trying to get those little one percents out of yourself yeah yeah and that's that's the hardest part of it when when you're in say a tenth two tenths of the lap record mm. and i mean it showed in gp the other day i think in fp3 or something it was like eight tenths between all riders while well, like first to 24th or something it was eight tenths and it's just like far out you want to find eight tenths of a track it's a it's the hardest thing you'll ever find in your life mm. and i mean i mean it's hard to find one tent sometimes so it's like you would like so many other riders would just be scratching their heads trying to figure out where they can find time mm. where do you look for time like where's the easiest place that you know you're gonna be costing yourself time most of the time you reckon the easiest place to find time on a like on a big track would probably be the fast corners just because you know you can it's faster so you can make so much more time yeah up there but when i say so much more time it's like half a tenth yeah. sometimes even less so um that's the thing that absolutely does your head in sometimes when it mm. feels like you're riding real fast and you come in and you're not slow but like you're like four tenths off your best lap time and it's just felt like the fastest lap you've ever done which is when you really start to scratch your head and it yeah. annoys you so much it, it sucks sometimes and it just does your absolute head in that's a there's a saying in golf that i just think's the best is feel isn't real 
Yeah, no, so it's not. So whatever you think you're doing with your swing, it's the same. And I find this exactly the same in motocross, like yep. jiu-jitsu, it's the same thing. Like yep. whatever you think you're doing, it actually doesn't look like that. No. And I've, it's always just blown me away when I can see guys like, you know, D. Wilson, for example, is a yep. motocross dude. And yep. it's just like his style and his technique – there's just never a foot wrong. Yeah. And then it's like he's thinking exactly what he's doing. Yeah. Whereas like I think I'm doing something and my body's just like not doing it. And then, then yeah, you go to try and like fix something, find time here or there. It's like that's the hardest thing to like get those two uh, internal and external things to line up. Yeah, I mean it's so annoying because I f- I'm like the same as you. I feel feel like I look like Casey or someone yeah. someone out on track two wheel slide yeah two There's wheel slide and it's just nothing going on I feel like I'm doing a good wheelie sometimes and the front wheel is probably like that much off the ground I mean I've probably got honestly one video ever that I'm really like huh I actually like that is it on your Instagram it's on my TikTok alright let's find it I we'll want to see it, it. <laughs> I want to see what good looks like everything looked pretty good to me the other day when we were on is that is that still like there's stuff that you can see um, Ollie Bayless 32 there's stuff that is like super obvious to you that you think you just do like fully kooky uh yeah some corners sometimes yeah yeah oh where are we uh at? the middle one oh, I can't even see shit I know <laughs> but I just like it because that's one video where I feel like I look pro in yeah. or even the one before that that one's not bad what are you talking about? The first video that I posted is good. Yeah, I'll watch this again. So what are you doing here, good? So I come out, have a do a bit of a wheelie, a bit yeah, of a wobble, and then yeah. I dangle my foot. I never dangle my foot. So what's I, the dangling I, of the foot? I, I don't know. I don't know. Everyone does it, so you decide to hop in on the trend. Um, have you seen that some of the MotoGP boys are running thumb brakes now? Yeah, I tried. Oh, really? Yeah, I did try and use one. And to be honest, when I did put it on, I was like five ten slower really yep so i took it straight off how long did you have it for uh probably a good two two track days yeah tried to get used to it and it just didn't happen fuck man that looks like a big bike with you on it there eh? yeah i look like a bit of a young pup on that but that's because i am yeah yeah yeah, a little (laughs) so what do you like about this video ah it's just darwin had a race win and yeah i kind of that's probably the most comfortable i've ever felt on the bike and although it kind of was sliding around a fair bit I just felt like felt I was in control, in control the whole yeah. time. Yeah, because she looks like she's getting pretty wild on you there. Ah, yeah, she is. She's always getting wild on me. <laughs> is it is it hard to ride? Yeah. Really? Yeah, especially a track like Morgan Park. What makes it hard? The bumps. Mm-hmm. The bumps and the... I wouldn't say elevation, but I mean, some, some parts of Morgan Park is a bit hilly and, you know, you're coming up on hills sometimes and then you're dropping off on hills. And that's when, you know, the bike really starts to feel like it's going to get away from you i mean like sometimes at morgan park you get a tiny bit of air coming out of turn seven onto the back straight it's a bit of a drop off and you hit it good enough and hit it at the right spot then yeah you will feel the bike get a bit of air which is cool it's cool you don't feel that anywhere else in australia so yeah yeah it's nice would you ever do like isle of man and stuff like that Nah, i don't think mum would let me either dude those guys are crazy yeah they are loose that's the one thing about road riding as well that maybe put me off it Mm. a little bit before I uh, got this Ducati was I remember when I was like 18 I worked at Cairns Honda oh, and yeah. um, I was doing some like bike sales and stuff like that and then you'd see these guys would come in and like they'd be buying new bikes or new tires and like yeah. they're just all the tires is just completely cooked like yeah. these dudes on these R1s or whatever sending it and then yeah. you hear stories of people coming in saying like how fast these guys are it's so loose there's so many gnarly guys that can just absolutely send it on, yeah. a, on a road bike and you're like dude this is not a controlled environment yeah like I mean when people go and race you know the Isle of Man or the I don't know what the race is called, but they do it in Macau, the the street race in Macau. Like they're so loose, they are so loose, and I give props to them because like I wouldn't do it's it. Just this, yeah, yeah. It's just that huge it's, cherries. Yeah, that's all it is because like they're going through streets doing like almost three hundred k an hour, and it's got like the length of this table truck width. No, nah. so it's like no, nah, I'd never do it. You couldn't pay me a certain amount of money to do it. 
and there's guys that are just like full specialists at it yeah and that would know like every single bump every single turn it's just like my god dude like peter hickman he's racing in um british Super bike championship now i think he's one of the goats of it probably yeah because i know he's won a lot of the isle of the mans and i mean he's just you watch videos of him and they are just like jumping jumping yeah. through streets doing 300k an hour it's just like and then you see the crashes oh. and like I think that's probably what's turned me off doing all the men ever. Yeah. Is seeing some of the crashes that people have there and it's just like No gravel traps. No gravel traps. And the gravel trap is a cliff edge or a house. Yeah, or yeah, someone's fence. Yeah. Someone's clothesline. Like I just would never do it and I I'm never even gonna think about doing it. It's one of those things too, like you wonder how is this legal? Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's been going crazy. for so long. It's crazy. It's got so much history, it's like, oh well, you can't stop it. I mean, like you see the laws in Australia and it's yeah it's like people are shutting down go-kart tracks and stuff because of noise mm. and then there's people you know doing the isle of man doing 300k an hour on cl- like cliff edges like it just makes absolutely no sense to me but the people that do do it you know good on you good yeah, on you absolutely if you savages. see this one day good on you <laughs> yeah. um the other really cool race which i it probably i mean it's super sketchy but pike's peak Ah, yeah. That looks pretty sick. Yeah, like, that, that seems like cool. way more controlled, like way more of like a normal thing to do. Like yeah. obviously it's still super gnarly, but... Yeah. I mean, I've seen a few videos and on my simulator at home, I've played, gone up Pikes Peak a few times and it'd just be so much fun to even go in a passenger mm. of a, you know, a good rally car or something going up there. It'd be cool. What sim do you use? Uh, Fanatec. Oh, so you you drive and you yeah. like that? Yeah, yeah, I love it. Hey, do you do eye racing? Yeah, a little bit of eye racing, a bit of Assetto Corsa, yeah. the competition version, F1's cool. Yeah. But yeah, I like eye racing. It's How cool. much time are you spending in those things? Uh, I used to spend a lot. When I first got it, I was probably going on it for two or three hours a day. Yeah. Because yeah. I had nothing to do. Yeah. I mean, I don't do a lot during the, the days and weekends now that I've finished school. Yeah. I kind of just train in the morning, train in the afternoon, hang out with my girlfriend and play my simulator. <laughs> what's, um, what's like the cars that you like? What's the... So at the moment, I've always been into kind of drift cars, always. I yeah. don't know why, I just find it interesting. So I'm building a Toyota Crusader in the shed at the moment. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so just slowly getting along with that thing. I've owned a couple of Falcons and all that. You get like an AU or something? Yeah, I had an AU they're that so I took to at. Archie one time. Yeah, they're just the they're such fun cars because you can just throw them around and do whatever yeah but um yeah i like uh yeah drift cars mainly so i heard the seto course is a good one for drifting yeah that's like course the most pretty, realistic one that's what i play pretty much most of the time now yeah yeah i love uh we got a sim here but oh, yeah. i've like i've had it set the first weekend i got it i set it up and i sat in that thing for like 12 <laughs> hours and i was like fuck this is not good i got up and i was like depressed after <laughs> hours. it's like it just sucked all the life out of me i was just like <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> turned into one of those dudes that just only plays video games yeah. and uh, after that i was like i don't know this probably isn't that good for you dude <laughs> yeah i mean I'm kind of at the point now when I know my limit on my video games I love video games and honestly I wish I could play them for more but you can't you do just get a a sense of depression I guess but um yeah it takes it it, it does, does take it out of you like, yeah. it's like dopamine or something you it know? just like, you're yeah. staring into a screen for so long and then you stop yeah you know it was <laughs> gnarly we played um we went to WA and we raced Manjim up last year oh yep and um and we went and stayed at Josh Sheeney's place yep. the night before practice he had VR goggles <laughs> and we were doing it with VR goggles oh, and I was no. just like man this is bad news like you could be in here for a hot minute <laughs> like I'm not one of them people that think the world's a simulation but then you go into VR and you think yeah. how, how do you know that people aren't doing this like yeah. as you yeah like it, it, it that's what confuses me is VR oh it dude. doesn't make sense the the cray I reckon what will probably be more of a thing that we do is like augmented reality yeah so i reckon the big thing it won't be vr where you like always where you put goggles on and then you'd like in the full world yeah i reckon there'll be some interface that we got where like you can make rooms look however you want yeah so like everything will be like this podcast studio will be like a white room yeah and then but you skin it 
you can so change it. Yeah, you'd be skinning everything and you'd like, you know, you have your can of Red Bull there, but then the Red Bull's like glowing or, <laughs> you know, like all that sort of stuff. I yeah. feel like the augmented reality thing is going to be... One day. Yeah, not even that far away, I don't think. Yeah. And because we were at... um, Have you been to Palm Springs the and in Burley? Are Maybe. You, are you local to Burley? I'm in Bundle, but we got the, one of our sheds is in Yeah, there. yeah. So it's just on Gold Coast Highway. It's this new little cafe called Palm Springs. It's yep. super cool. But it's like right on the highway. And then you, you sort of like sit here. And then if you're like looking this way, it all looks Palm Springsy. There's cactus. It's yeah, all right. White. It looks super cool. And then if you look here, Gold Coast Highway, McDonald's, <laughs> yeah. like, it looks like shit. <laughs> yeah. So like that's where augmented reality stuff will come in is yeah. where you'll have like the restaurant or palm springs you look this way it's just like desert yeah. you know there'll be like a, a cool kind of skin almost so like yeah. every mexican restaurant you go to will look like mexico yeah look and like then, fiesta or something yeah like every japanese restaurant you'll look out the window and it'll be like kyoto gardens like <laughs> i reckon that that's the shit that's going to be pretty gnarly yeah it's going to be you know i think one day it will happen i don't see why it can't if it's happening in video games why can't it happen in real life i guess web 3.0 yep Web 3.0. Metaverse. <laughs> we'll see when that happens, guys. <laughs> yeah. Have you been... Do you, like, follow much of that shit? Or, like, do Not you really. Into the, that much? My brother does a lot. And yeah, he right. kind of is always coming home and speaking about it, which is why it's kind of come to me. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just keen to see what actually happens in the future. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's weird if you if you think about it. Like, what's the world going to be in, in a thousand years? Oh, yeah. Who knows if it'll be here? Exactly. That's what I'm thinking. I don't reckon it'll exist in a thousand years. Yeah, maybe, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's weird it is weird it's weird what's the what's the sim like on a gp bike i haven't tried it haven't it'd be fun it. to try i might try it when i get home yeah right. set it up so it's like a gp bike and you can turn the uh, steering wheels oh have you ever done like a gp sim though no no yeah never. right one thing i do want to try is there's heaps in america and there's some in australia is the when you put a dirt bike or something on the i guess it's like a wheelie simulator really it's on like a dyno yeah and they strip like have a the front wheel on a bungee spring so you can't flip it yeah and you just practice your wheelies really yeah how do you can you what would we google for that oh uh, i guess wheelie simulator wheelie trainer maybe yeah wheelie trainer for motos yeah i want to do this because i suck at wheelies how to wheelie your motorcycle uh i want to find because i know that there's like there's manual things that you can do on a um, on a pushy. You can build like yep. a manual. So that's it's just like a oh yeah, there you go. Is that yeah? It's kind of like what I'm talking about. It's the same concept. So what's the huh? So it's like training wheels, kind of. Yeah, it's training wheels, and you will, it like it's got the part on it where it won't let you flip the oh, bike. Oh yeah. So if you're just sitting at the balance point, and yeah, nothing's right. touching, then it'll be the same as like it, how it is on the road that's pretty sick yeah I, i've always wanted to have a go on because like i can wheelie a bike just not that good no i reckon you can do it pretty good but probably yeah obviously not like yeah have you um have you ever heard of aaron colton aaron colton red bull dude i think the name rings a bell, yeah, yeah yeah he's a mate of mine and dude he, he's like the red bull stunt guy yeah and uh the shit he can do yeah go to like the end of this video the shit that he can do is insane, man. So he built like this, uh, this altar, uh, redshift, but he turned it into a, um, like a motard bike. Yep. Man, the shit he does is insane. And like, I've seen him in, you know, like Red Bull car park and yep. whatever. And it's just the bike control, man, yeah, that he has. It's insane. Fast forward it to where he's riding through the thing. Like, and even some of the videos, like the, like the videos that I've always watched is like the wild out wheelie boys I don't know if they're still a thing yeah, but yeah, the guys yeah. in America just absolutely ripping up the streets on dirt bikes it's like so cool to watch and where do they learn half this stuff and how many times have they crashed yeah you don't see any of the crashes and no. I want to know how many times they have crashed because like they're so good at doing wheelies yeah that's like to get that good you would have had to fuck it up so many times yeah. so uh once he gets going in this but yeah you just wonder like dude how he's not really doing many wheelies he's riding through like a glass museum 
There yeah, like, go. how the fuck do you learn how to do that shit? Oh, I, it doesn't make sense. There's That's... um, there's all those guys too. This one of the cool things with Instagram Reels is that like you just start watching something and you just watch like a million yeah. of those videos. Yeah, and you see some of the dudes on like legitimate super bikes. Yeah, and they are just like guys in the street, and they're so good at. They're that just shit. ripping up, doing like three sixties while doing wheelies. It. Like and like front when they do the front wheel stoppies and squeeze the front brakes, they do a one eighty and then like fakey out of it. No, like it just makes no sense to me how nah. they do it. And so, like top rack's really good at it. Top rack, he's like riding his three hundred in his like in Keen and stuff off of his cart track. Yeah, and just doing like the biggest stoppies and then three sixties uh, while on the back wheel. Like it's just like doesn't make sense to me i wonder if there's go back to those wheelie things rones i wonder if you can if there is any of those in australia i wonder how hard it'd be to make one what do they even call it maybe that's what we should do one day a yeah. project wheelie build we should do that I reckon. <laughs> it'd be cool yeah wheelie bar that yeah we should do that couldn't that's, be too hard that should be a video that we do yeah, like definitely. learning how definitely. to wheelie that it'd be fun if we oh here they go up that third one there doesn't nah let's see this one here brat vlogs 1200 on aliexpress we got that oh wow all right that's pretty cool yeah we're on to something yeah enough. we're on to something next time we see you guys we'll be um doing wheelies so this is how these wheelie boys learn their shit yeah it must ah, be <laughs> i knew there was some, all right we're getting to the bottom <laughs> we of gotta get, shit. Yeah. all right Okay, I'm into this because I do want to learn how to do wheelies. I can wheelie push, he's awesome. But yep. you know why I can do that? Because that's all I did when I was a kid for <laughs> my entire life with wheelie, wheelie pushies. Wheelie pushy. Yeah. Consequences, just not the same. Yeah. This can't be that hard. No. It'd be good. Like I feel like if I had a long enough straight, I could wheelie forever. But I've, I've, I want to learn how to get me feet up on the seat. Oh, so you want to go like full, yeah. full jobby. Full millispec. Give us some sound on this one, Rones. I want to see the... Oh, it's not fine too. Ne never mind. Fast forward a little bit. I wonder if this is this guy's, like, first ever time. It probably... Like, he doesn't look like he's that confident of a rider. This would be very interesting to see how good he can get. This is the perfect way to do this. this you could probably perfect. learn in, like, 45 minutes. Yeah, if you spend enough time on it, I think you could be... You know, like that bloke that we've seen before, Aaron Colton. Look at him go. <laughs> Are you serious? We're on. We're on. We're doing this. This is my... Wait. This is where my budget's going for my next bike. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This dude's... No. Shut the fuck up. Are you serious? Look at that. That's in about five minutes. Literally, dude. <laughs> this is crazy. I feel like we should probably delete this bit because everyone's going to learn how to do this. Wow. I'm actually blown away. Yeah, that dude's getting this real guy, good this, real fast. Look, they're, even they're tripping. Wow. <laughs> so, for people that are just listening, how would we explain this? So, it's like, it's basically got training wheels that go into the axle and then there's like a cushion where the dude kind of lands on so it's like this little trailer so this is how all these dudes get so yeah, good you're how, right this is you, how all the wild out wheelie boys you knew there was something going on here dude what are we what are we doing I this weekend know. now I want to have a go <laughs> yeah, one of these this is all I can think about <laughs> I've completely forgotten about the podcast wow alright so there's some secrets to this there is some secrets fuck and the sim we're getting onto this yeah we're getting onto this one. Oi, you wait the wheelie the, machine by the time I give back this monster <laughs> I'm just going oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh that's so sick alright that is very very interesting that seriously can't be that hard to build no it's just like a, a tricycle with a motorbike attached to it <laughs> yeah right um, is there any other like bucket list moto things that you kind of want to do or like you'd love to experience on two wheels? I'd love to go and watch the Isle of Man, definitely. Yeah. Um, the Dakar as well. I yeah. think like going to watch a, a tour of that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just going, going in something cool, going on a two up of, you know, I don't know who does them nowadays, Randy Mamola, I think maybe. In the... He does the GP ones. Yeah, yeah. 
I've been on the back of Dud. That was good fun, except we crashed. Oh, what? Yeah, we crashed at Winton. What? Yeah, it was my first... Honestly, it was my first race weekend on the 300. Yeah. And uh, my bike didn't start for the first race, so I was in a horrible mood. And Dad said he'd take me on the back of a two-up. So, uh, obviously, he tried to give it his all. We uh, ran on and crashed in the gravel trap. It was pretty funny. <laughs> and then we came in and Mum wanted to kill Dad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, she's the real boss of the Yeah, Mum's the, bo- Mum's the boss of the household, definitely. Fair enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Your dad would be like, fuck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what about bikes to like that's one of the things that as i'm getting a little bit older i'm like i kind of just want to ride everything experience everything especially now with the riding a road bike for the first time i feel like it's really opened up my mind to what's possible on a bike and the different kind of experiences that you can have like i was definitely very like one track minded moto 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 yeah and now i'm sort of looking at my bikes as like the oh, this is the old way of thinking it's like got your practice bike then you got your race bike yeah and that's it yeah and you just they're the bikes that you ride yeah and now i'm like man i don't care if i have no race bikes like let's just have <laughs> all these different bikes that you can do all this different stuff on yeah. and i never thought i'd like enduros i love riding enduros and then riding that multi strata yeah i think that was probably the bike that made me realize you can ride more than just how, one bike. yeah like how much is out there in the yeah. world of motorcycling yeah and uh after riding that we went the first time i rode it we did a me and dad five we did like a 500k rider rode up to springwood in brizzy yeah and then we went all through the glasshouse mountains we rode dirt we rode like uh like single tracky sort of stuff yeah and then we rode not tight but um then we rode some dirt roads then we rode full open highways and then we were doing yeah. twisties and i was just like 500Ks went so quick yeah. and we just had so much fun. So it sort of really has opened up my mind to all these different, I guess, types of riding yeah. and types of bikes that I want to do. Yeah. Obviously, you're like very one track minded in terms of the racing side of things. But yeah. like, do you have anything that you kind of think about? One thing that I want to ride and I reckon I will in my my time left on this earth is a 500 two stroke one of the old race bikes i've just like road bike yeah a road bike i've just always wanted to ride one and i had a ride of dad's um cr 500 oh has he got one he had one he sold it oh. we had a we had a couple of them and like that thing was just insane really i've never ridden one you haven't ridden one nah i, I thought you would have but nah. like i've never been at, I've, I've never even been at the track when one's there yeah right so like That's so rare like first second third fourth fifth gear it doesn't matter how fast you're going and um yeah it'll just wheel stand like the power band on it is is crazy crazy and like even like i've got a 21 uh 252 stroke yep. yamaha like even that thing's so quick like it, yeah. it'll wheelie in any year but um yeah i really want to ride a one of the old um 500 road box there's a couple at McDoan's. Yeah, he's got a couple. I might call them up. <laughs> Mc, they're in a room. There's yeah, five of them. Yeah, and they're all in this one yeah, nice weird. room with all these trophies. Yeah, I don't know why. Surely they still work. I might just give them a call up, see if yeah, I can yeah, ride yeah. one. <laughs> Mighty Mick, want to borrow one of your two Yeah, can, can I ride it at your go-kart track, please, yeah, mate? <laughs> yeah. Uh, do, you, do you get in the go-karts much as well? A little bit. I used to. So that's what I started off in, actually. Yeah, right. In go-karts with Brock and Jack and kind of rode a dirt bike, and that's when I wanted to go down that route. Yeah, but right. um, yeah, I love go karts, and me and my best mate will will go to slide place, you know, once every two weeks or something, have a bit of fun. That place is pretty sick. Yeah, it's cool. And then we used to go because I used to train on the road bike at uh, Extreme Carton in Pimpama. Yeah. So every time we went there, we'd also have a little go on the go karts or something. But yeah, I love slide place. It's great fun. Do you reckon you could have done the car like the cart thing? Like, did you feel the same kind of connection to it, or like, did you have the same sort of speed, or like a little bit? I mean, back in the day, I was like C grade state champion, so uh, <laughs> I was like the man to be. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Jack who>? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like the carts, but like, kind of motorbikes felt a bit more home to me, so that's yeah. the route that I went down. It's pretty cool, little little era that's starting to emerge with like you got brock doing what he's doing you got jack who's probably going to be an f2 next year yeah you got yourself like there's a seems like there's always these little pockets of aussies that kind of you know come through or like a similar age and similar time and they grew up racing you know either carts or flat track or whatever together yeah i mean it's weird like the amount of times that 
me, Brock, and Jack have raced karts, like, yeah, go-karts together. And now we've all kind of gone our own way. Like, Brock's going down V8. Jack's going down F1. Now I'm going down road bikes. Like, it's weird how it can all form into so many different things. And, like, even Will Brown. Yeah. Like, Shout out to Will. Yeah, his first that was a race. good one. Yeah. That was sick. That was real cool. He's but such yeah, a good dude. Yeah, he's sick. He's really cool. And, like, um, we were... I think he was one class up than us, but, you know, still the same era. Yeah. And, you know, everyone's gone their separate ways and we're all going really good, which is good to see. Do you all keep in contact with each other that much? Not much with Will, but I'm sure Jack and um, Brock do. But, yeah, I still talk to Brock and and Jack and I think me and Brock, we might go to Cali, Ble- Cali Beach Club over... Oh, the, the boys! Uh, over over oh. the December break, maybe. Unreal. <laughs> I still haven't been there yet, actually. No, neither have I. It looks good, though. Yeah, it does look good. Yeah. I think when, um, I mean, obviously, like, you're going to the uh, Europe in January and you're going to sort of start your career, like, I definitely think that it's probably one of the things that um, I'd say, like, from I've lived over in the States for a long time, like, yep. I spent nearly my whole 20s over there. Yeah. I definitely think it's important to stay close with some boys that are going through, like, the yeah, same definitely. thing that that you are yeah um and you know you can kind of see that now with um you got hunter and jet and they're hanging out with chucky a lot and yeah. like they're super tight with danny rick and yeah i think you know it's kind of important to it's an individual sport and you you know you're busy doing your own thing but i think having some guys that you can relate to what you're going through yeah. They, yeah, exactly. they're the same age they know where you come from you know where they came from you're going through a similar thing you're away from your family you're, yeah you know you're dealing with all these kind of new things so i feel like that you know they're probably some good relationships to like just keep you know investing in yeah um, exactly especially yeah as you, you get older and, and busier and stuff like that like i definitely that helped me a lot when I was yeah. over there was just having some Aussie boys like because you know Europe's great Europeans are great but yeah. there's we've got you need to have a bit of home yeah exactly you know which is good because you know Jack Jack Miller Billy Van yeah. Erd, you yeah. know they're pretty close to me and I grew up racing dirt bikes with Billy really so uh, we've always had a I wouldn't say a close relationship but we've always been pretty good mates Yeah. so it'll be good when I go over there I'll have someone to you know, go pushy riding with, go to the tracks with. Yeah. It'll just be a cool atmosphere. Yeah. How, how far will you be from, from Jack? I don't know. However far Andorra to Ravenna is probably a couple of hours. Oh, that's hours not, maybe. that shouldn't be too far, no, eh? Couldn't be too far. You'd hope so. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think every time I have a little break, I'll uh, head to Andorra because that's where a lot of the Aussies are staying and a lot of the world should buy guys and MotoGP guys. Yeah. So it'll be good just to get close with a lot of them guys because that's who you'll be spending a lot of time with yeah yeah how good's Billy A eh? he's sick I he's the kid. freak of nature that, that child <laughs> him on like a big motocross or dirt track bike is just unbelievable to it's watch. crazy <laughs> eh? like he's the most like unassuming and he doesn't say anything ever no he doesn't like, he's just like I'd love to have him on the podcast <laughs> wouldn't say a word the whole time but he's like the he's like the definition of like the strong and silent type and oh, he just yeah. looks like you know, small little fella, and yeah. he just like will go and smoke anybody on anything with two wheels. He just goes and rips. It's crazy that kid. <laughs> Have you seen the videos of him on the super motard at Mariba? Oh yeah, just like letting the thing hang out to where it's pretty much at ninety degree angle, just like it's nothing. And, and Franco was saying that at the start of the day he was like terrible. <laughs> like yeah, so, right. the first time he got there, like, and he just had no idea, like yeah. no idea how to ride it, make it work. And then by the end of the day, pretty much just like dragging the thing around yeah, every turn. he's loose, that kid. He's loose. You just can't not like him. I know, it'd be <laughs> sick to have that much talent. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah, and then, on a dirt bike, it'd oh, just be crazy. And then he won the North Brizzy Cup last year. Yep. Just, you got hooky you know, there, just comes home, there. smokes it, goes back to Europe like it's nothing. Frustrating. Yeah, it is. It is frustrating. <laughs> so, so when you go over, what's the process like do you kind of know what you're in for do you you know like are you nervous about leaving home for the first time or where where's your headspace at with it wouldn't say i'm nervous you know i'm pretty excited to get over there and get this career going um we'll take a lot of the things that we have over from here save us getting a lot of things over there you know bring a bike push bike yeah uh mountain bike and then where we're moving it's got a massive lake in it so um paddle wardens yeah so yeah so i can go for a surf ski every now and then um 
yeah, we'll probably get a motocross bike over there so I can do some riding. Um, but yeah, we'll move over there late January. I think we'll have some tests coming up and uh, yeah, just go from there. I'm keen, so keen to get it started with. And and so what's the, like the team, the bike, the whole kind of program that, does it all feel like sort of familiar, like you know what you're getting yourself into? Yeah, so I've got a Ducati V2 over here so we're building that up now so i can oh sick you got one yeah so instead of learning a bike and truck when i go over there i can yeah just have to learn the trucks yeah so we'll start riding that thing as much as we can when it gets finishing being built and uh yeah just get over there ride as fast as we can yeah it's a main goal really what do you think it's going to be like riding a v2 compared to the v4 that you've been riding this year i think it's going to be a lot less uh wearing on my body yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But, yeah, I feel like it's just going to be what it was like when we uh, rode 600s. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it should be good. That's the bike I'm lying off. Yeah, it's a good bike. I'll just buy yours when you go over. <laughs> yeah. You'll probably keep it here, eh? Oh, I don't know. We'll see what Ducati want to do with it. See what, see, yeah, okay. <laughs> see what Ooh, the bosses want to do with very, it. Very, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're super into training. Yeah. That's a good thing, yep. being a professional athlete, because yeah. not a lot of people are into... Uh, training as such you know what i mean like yeah. the, the dog days of you know putting your head down on a on a cycle bike or yeah. you know pedaling up hills when did you start enjoying training i probably like for a good two years i didn't enjoy it at all but i knew i had to do it mm. and then after then i started doing some pushy races and stuff like that and uh you know i i realized that i wasn't so bad on a push bike so i kind of enjoyed it and started to go faster and then when Brock, Brock and Dad started getting into it properly with me, yeah, it was good because that's like another thing where it was like always a competition. Yeah. So uh, me and Brock still to this day for the past three years we're like always on each other's toes about the pushy, always, and um, yeah, I've always got it up on him, which is good. <laughs> so, same with Dad. No, nah, Dad's uh, after his little injury, it um, kind of stayed with him a bit, but before then we were just like absolutely smashing each other all the time on just who's the faster pushy rider who's the faster pushy rider who's the faster pushy rider <laughs> do you like the mountain bike stuff better or the road stuff i think the mountain bike it's cool i used to go out to boomerang farm a lot on like oh yeah a downhill bike and Sick. chuck some whips and Sick. all that kind of stuff have you got footage of you doing that uh yeah there should be is a, that on the gram yeah there, there will be one on the gram of me breaking my arm actually oh really i tried to 360 uh, oh um, yeah see there's no future in that no nah, i tried to 360 a dirt jumper and you're not gonna do rampage didn't bro. End well. go down a little bit we um we just went to Derby on the weekend. Oh, yeah. Man. So, oh, Derby. Yeah. Derby is sick. Have you been there? Yeah. So good, eh? I, I want to try and get, actually get back there in the Christmas holidays. I think we should all plan a trip. Oh, I'm The team down. will love it. Benny loves it. Dad loves it. Oh, it's do just, all those boys mountain bike? Yeah, Benny loves it. Yeah, right. Yeah, so we went... Um, That's a go up the tiniest bit. Down the tiniest bit. Uh, Where's that? Yeah, that might not be a bad one. What are we working with here? What bikes do you ride? This is actually a Ducati e-bike. Oh, dude. Really? You yeah. got one of those things? Yeah, one of the Thox. Yeah, right. I was actually looking at them last night. Where do you ride at Narang mostly? or? Uh, yeah, I rode a fair bit at Narang. Yeah. And um, then I started getting into it really at Boomerang. Yeah, right. Oh, there's a good one. Chucking a... Oh, a little knacky? Oh, yeah. Is that McGrath? Okay, yeah. Ate it. <laughs> oh, so this is the one where you got wheels. Is this at Runaway Bay? Yeah, this is at Runaway Bay. What are you up to? I love it. It's just two wheels, eh? That's all you need. Yeah, two wheels and a dream. <laughs> two wheels and a dream. <laughs> they're actually pretty peaky, peaky jumps. Yeah, they're good. I'm sure there's a video of me here just like absolutely eating it. Who's your MMA boy? That's Mitch. That's my brother. Oh, what? Yeah. Actually, really? go up a little bit. Yep, down the tiniest bit. I didn't know that he fought. Yeah, he fought for a bit. That's sick. He was a bit of a beast. Yeah, right. <laughs> does he do jiu-jitsu as well? Yeah. So yeah. he stopped fighting and now he just does a little bit of jiu-jitsu every now and then. Yeah, sick. What but, belt did he get into uh, in jiu-jitsu? I don't know, because he just kind of just fought for an MMA gym. Yeah, yeah. If you yeah. go that one there, yeah, that one there. And then the clip across is where I break my arm. But this so is where's like this jump. at, Boomerang? This is at Boomerang, yeah. Oh, they're fucking pretty big jumps. Yeah, they're cool. Then we go one across, and yeah, this is it. Wait, oh. 
Yep, and kind of instantly you're yeah, broken. Yeah, you just know, eh? Yep. Once you've done it a couple of times, you do just know. Yeah. Hang yeah, on. mine was collarbones. Was it? Oh, I've broke my collarbone like five times. Yeah, I'm lucky enough to not have that done. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I got pretty... I got three on one side, two on the other. Oh. Just every... But you know what? I grew up riding in like the neck brace era when the yeah, neck braces right. first come out. Yeah. And I feel like that's what would, would do it. Like you'd Because it stopped your, your head. neck from yeah, taking the impact yeah. and it would do your collarbone. Yeah. So yeah. I did like fucking so many of the things. <laughs> yeah. though. It was that ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so I, I haven't done any of those in a while, touch wood. But <laughs> I stopped wearing the neck brace and then fucking they stopped popping off. Yep. But was that your worst injury, you reckon? Uh... It was the worst, like, broken bone injury. I've had a blood clot and a uh, staph infection in the one in my hip once. Really? Which was just from crashing motorbikes, and, you know, just kept on falling on the one hip. And then, uh, had, you know, I realized it was bad when I was sitting at school one time and we had them, you know, big silver chairs that you'd sit on. And one of my yeah. friends came sliding in and one of them hit my hip and it just, like, felt like someone just stabbed me in the hip. Really? So, yeah, I went to hospital and that was probably my worst injury, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, I've broken a couple of arms, foot, ankle, you know. You do it all when you're riding motorbikes. Yeah, you do yeah. It all. Have, have they come on the road bike, though, the bad injuries? No. I've never broke... Oh, until the other day, I've never broken a bone on my arm. Oh, yeah, so you crashed the other day. Yeah, had a big crash the other day, just mucking around with my dad. Big high side. Big high side. Biggest one I've had on the smallest bike that I've ridden. It doesn't make sense, but... Did you have you got footage of the bikes that you were riding when you crashed? Yeah, because your dad said that you that you said your dad missed the actual crash. Yeah, right? if we go to the top, um, so that video on the very right, yeah, that one there. This is the bike that I ride. So what's this thing? Uh, just a Kawasaki four hundred. Yeah, right. You pick them up for the rep from the wreck is really cheap. Oh, so and that this would be like your little first track bike kind of thing. Yeah, pretty much. They're the perfect bike because. You can get them cheap from the wreckers. How much is cheap? Two to three grand. Yeah. And they've got like a bit of crash damage, but it's cheaper for the guys to ride them off than yeah, claim yeah, insurance than, on them. So. To, yeah. And so what, you you then just ride these around yeah, put like go-kart tracks pretty much. Yeah, put some suspension on it and go and ride your hard away. It doesn't tear through tires. Yeah. So um, yeah, they're just the best bikes and they can handle so much. Yeah, right. Yeah, that looks pretty sick, eh? Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, they you get into the things, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. You kind of... The the best part about riding the 400s is you go to the track to find your limit. Mm. And then... Then you dial it back for the... Well, then you go over the limit and then you dial it back a little <laughs> yeah, bit. <laughs> yeah. But I suppose for like the bigger bikes, you'd kind of know... You're yeah. not trying to test the limits on, yeah, the, exactly. on the bigger bikes. Yeah, unless you're trying to put out like a, a really fast qualifying lap then yeah you're kind of always um pretty within. one step off the limit yeah um yeah like I, i'm not sure the fastest that i've been on the ducati 100 probably yeah um, <laughs> a bit fast <laughs> nah, 160 at all yeah um but there's definitely a point where i'm like ah oh, fuck i don't know <laughs> this is a lot like how do you work up to that and do you have that point now on like a on a big bike or it's weird i've kind of lost fear as as i've ridden the bike more i mean you get really nervous when someone has a big crash at the track that you're riding at mm. and that's the only thing that kind of sets you back a little bit and i think it's the same for most riders um but like say if you have a crash or something the main thing is you just want to get back on the bike before you pack up and go home Mm. because you never really want to end on a crash 100% because that does your head in yeah that does your head in big time for the next time that you ride the bike I think that as well is a big thing with like injuries yeah so I crashed at Rocky yeah and then it was first lap of the race and I had a massive one I got lapped twice before I got going again yeah but I was like I'm riding yeah just so I know I'm alright because as soon as you sit down and you start bruising and swelling and everything tightens up and then it plays in your mind like do I need to go to the hospital but if you finish the race or you got up and kept riding then you know you're you're alright yeah yeah it's weird and it does like it kind of makes sense on how it works but it's just one of the things that you have to do like obviously if you broken a bone or something real bad then you're not going to get back on it but like say if you just like even me the other day when I had the crash two weeks ago did my shoulder all I wanted to do was get back on the bike and unfortunately I couldn't but I know 
I know why I crashed and that's one of the main things as well yeah instead of jumping back on the bike if you know why you crashed then you know yeah you won't do that again obviously yeah so um it's good and a lot of the issues that young or unexperienced people have is they have a crash but they don't know why they crashed Mm. so that's that's another reasons why people you know can't can't get going after they do have a a Mm. bit of a crash yeah they're just like completely in the dark and then they're just scared that it's going to happen again yep exactly but so the the speed thing like do you think that that's just something that you get used to um when I rode the 300s, you know, they they only do a top of probably 170 on a track like Phillip Island. Yeah, okay. And then 600s, you know, you got closer to the 200, 210 mark. Actually, no, I think, you, no, you went way faster than that, like 260, 280. Yeah. And um, then on the super bikes, it's kind of just like a little step up from the 600s, which is good. Yeah. But I mean, someone jumping, say, from a 300 to to super bike you'll really feel the difference in the top speed yeah so you think it's just something that you just slowly got to kind of work up to yeah yeah exactly yeah because i mean i know anytime where it's hard to i guess like if you're not on a actual track yeah to feel safe going yeah exactly that far so i I don't know maybe it would be a little bit different um yeah you know if if it was yeah like phillip island you got like a big main straight and it feels pretty safe but yeah, there's definitely a, a point where I'm like, Ooh, this feels faster than I want to go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I think everyone that's ridden a bike on the road and then they go to the track, they feel way more comfortable when they're on the track to go, you know, to really let their bike sing because there's no other cars or anything around. There's no traffic lights you have to worry about. There's, you know, not a lot of that stuff, which is why um, I think a lot of, like at track days and stuff, people have a lot of injuries and mm. uh, crashes because they do get a bit too excited and i mean that's what causes they don't know when to you know knock it off a little bit or something like that yeah yeah that makes sense yeah i'd, I'd be interested to see what it, it would be like to because norwell you can't i think you couldn't really open my it up, top really. speed was probably like 160 yeah. or something like that i yeah. think i think i was your dad was hooking but that he was on like a pretty fast bike. yeah that multi strata bit he was doing like 180 yeah i know around there it's fucking especially awesome. on that big bike insane yeah eh? it was loose i can't believe how good that thing turned with yeah it was too eh? it was crazy how much power that thing had it surprised me did you did roan show you the video where you see him like step out on the no. thing <laughs> oh man yeah even jacko that was filming was like whoa <laughs> comes out of uh you got the back straight and then you go right and then that left yeah oh like, no i did see that yeah he had a big moment yeah that, but no i think your thing would be good for like say 240 250 at track like phillip island yeah be cool. right be cool to see it yeah, it would be pretty cool to try. One day we'll have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Road I, trip it to Phillip Island. I would love to do that. <laughs> eh? It's, yeah, that'd be a, an experience for sure. Yeah. Um, so what what do you see your career? Like what's the route that you would want to take? And then why, why that route as opposed to other routes? Like, because I feel like when it comes to a career like yours, there is quite a bit of planning that goes into yep. it. So like where's the headspace in that? So, I mean, we're doing World Super Sport next year. And then I think I only want to be in that class for around... This is like the ideal yeah, the yeah. ideal career yeah. path. I only want to be in World Super Sport for two years and then move to World Super Bike. Uh, be in there for however long it takes me to be the best and be the, peop- be the person that people want to beat. And then try and go into MotoGP, I think, is the ideal one for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. So, what's the what would be the thinking of trying to do the superbike thing before gps as opposed to trying to do gps or like because i guess i don't really understand how it normally works or like the path people normally take i think it's just because the teams in gp want a lot of the riders that are going down the gp route like moto 3 moto 2 then to moto gp yeah whereas world superbikes are same they want people from world super sport 300 world super sport 600 yeah and then i think moto gp and world superbike kind of take riders for themselves yeah less less moto gp riders uh moto gp teams taking world super bike riders it's a lot the other way around but i think it also comes into contention if you're good enough then it can happen yeah and i think it's going to show with top rack i think there's a lot of rumors and talk that he'll be going to moto gp in the next couple of years which will be good to see yeah so what's the difference just the power of the bikes and i think how they make the bikes because like moto gp bikes I couldn't tell you one part that was on them. Yeah, they right. change. Honestly, I think everything, 
every single part that's on the bike they change so they're just like full works it's not not production based at all no it's like a drag car i guess you can't make oh like not anyone can make them yep 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 and then so the world super bikes are based on more production models. yeah exactly they're based on a production bike but you can change a bit of the stuff in their engines and how the bike handles really yeah okay and so why not just try go straight down the moto gp route i didn't really go down that route because on a moto 3 bike i would have been too big Mm. i never really rode one and when we got the chance to go and ride for red bull rookies i wasn't i wouldn't say i was too big i was just um a bit more ready more ready for the 300s yeah and to go down that route instead of you know going overseas at such a young age because it wouldn't have worked for me and right now i'm so happy i didn't do that yeah um but yeah it just wouldn't have worked for me going from moto 3 to moto 2 and we had the chance to go to moto 2 but we wanted to see what else was out there yeah and you know i think where we are at now is the perfect ride for me at the moment yeah yeah that's that's cool because yeah i mean i i definitely just never really understood like the pathway and i'm sure um you know i guess it's just a more familiar route to with like your dad doing um doing what he did um but he won a moto gp and a superbike in the same year didn't he? yeah yeah so um in 2006 i think it was he won the world superbike championship and then one of the uh, ducati Right, I just can't remember who it was. Had a crash and couldn't race the last round. So they gave Dad the opportunity and yeah, he won it, which is cool. Because that's when <laughs> Nicky so, Hayden won in the same year. That's so gangster. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. Yeah, what did you think about the MotoGP on the weekend with Rossi? It was cool. It was really cool. And I don't think he they could have planned it a different way. I mean, um, he's planned to retire, I think, for two years now. And it was so good to see the the atmosphere of the crowd and the other riders giving him so much respect um yeah it was it was sad to see him go really he's been in it for i think 25 years or 26 years and um i think he could almost probably call himself the goat of uh oh, the moto gp and i think anyone would agree on that yeah and to like you know to be the guy that just completely like elevated the sport to yeah. full mainstream and and i was talking about it with jet but you know you got the broadcast going on and you've got ronaldo and you've got yeah. every formula one driver chris hemsworth roger federer like you know all of these people that he's had this massive impact on and then yeah i think the the craziest thing watching the that end of that race was when he pulled into the pits and then suzuki had yeah. the you know, he's, he's like not a suzuki dude yeah. suzuki's got a banner for him and then he pulls his bike in and then he doesn't even have to put it on a stand or anything like there's so many people that yeah, just are exactly. so close that he stands up on the tank like it's pretty special yeah it was cool it was cool i think it would have been great to be there just to see his run last race and he did really he good. did real good he did real good I he's had he was a, off of 131 the whole race no he's had um uh, a rough i think year and a half now but um yeah it was good to finish his last ride on one last send-off yeah it's cool yeah and so you got to ride it at the rossi farm yeah do you remember that experience yeah it was cool i um we were going over there for world ducati week and got the chance to go and ride there and initially i was only young i think i must have been 11 or something and i we were asking if we could get a 250 or something because, you know, I was still a young pup. I still am. But I was still a young pup and they only had 450s, so uh, I jumped on the 450s with all the VR46 Academy guys. And it was so much fun. It was great. You know, like, there's no trucks in Australia, no dirt trucks like what he's got over there. Really? Yeah, it just feels like you're you're riding on, the, on a beach with slick tyres. Really? Yeah, you just let the bike hang out and it's just great. Go to, um, what's he call it, 46 Ranch or something? Yeah, the VR46 Yeah, go to VR46 Ranch on YouTube. See if there's any footage of him, of that flat track. That Oh, there you go. We won't be able to show this on the screen. We'll get bloody flag for sure. <laughs> Dude, it looks pretty amazing. Eh? Oh, it's crazy. Like the, it's just insanely wow. nice. I've never actually seen... I mean, I think I've seen some, like, photos and stuff, but yeah. I've never really watched anything like this. Yeah. Go to the... Um, just fast forward through it a bit, right? He's such a legendary dude, eh? Like, it, just even his character, like, every time you see... Um, oh, yes. Every time you see him on camera. Yeah. Like, just such, like, a cool, personable guy. Yeah. How did they get the track like that? 
I don't know. I think it's just like it. It looks like just sand. Yeah. It's just loose sand, but like when you're riding on it, the thing like doesn't matter what bike you'd be on. You could be on a CR500, and I don't reckon you could wheelie it there. Really? Yeah. I mean, like it's just so loose, and you just let the things hang out so much. Man, that is insanely cool. So, how old were you on a 450? 11. Oh, 11 <laughs> or 12. <laughs> oh, that's so gnarly, dude. Oh, that's awesome. Um, oh, here we go. Full lap on board. Man, I don't understand how they get it like that. I, like when I went there when I was real young, I think the king of the track at that time was Morbidelli. Yeah, right. So, he was the fastest man there on the dirt bikes, and yeah. They just ride there all the time. It's crazy. Yeah, so this is like... They've full got little, uh, like, curves and stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. It's in, like, how um, incredible it is. It was just a ride there. It was, like, sick. Was it... Uh, I mean, obviously, even at 11, I'm sure you probably knew... Yeah. Like, you could tell, like, the aura of Valentino. Yeah. You know? I mean, we were driving in me dad and mum we were driving into the ranch and um you know everyone the fans that were just sitting outside the gate waiting for him and then when we left he he came with us and um stayed at the gate just to see his fans it was just crazy really so there's like fans just waiting just outside. waiting outside his gate really yeah it felt like you know when you see one of them videos of the kardashians or something yeah. hopping outside the house that's what it was like honestly he is like the king of the king of europe you could say yeah yeah yeah, pretty crazy, man. And um, yeah, special, special career. And you just don't think that you'd see something like that again. Yeah. It just feels like all those, you know, Ricky Carmichael, yeah. you know, like you got um, like Valentino. There's just so many of those old legacy champions yeah. that, you know, they just did so much. I guess, you know, ushering in like the modern era of those yeah, exactly. sports. Yeah, yeah they've all just um, helped, I guess. <clears throat> they've all just helped progress the bikes and the tracks and literally everything everything to do with the sport into how it is today mm. and it's cool that's pretty rad man well um yeah i won't keep you too much longer i appreciate no, that's right. appreciate your time thank you but uh it's been good and yeah i appreciate the yeah hanging over the last few weeks we've we've been talking about doing this for yeah we've been uh, ages we keep just getting in the way of each other <laughs> yeah yeah but i'm glad that like i always say I never get too stressed out on podcasts like scheduling <laughs> things because it always seems to work out. Yeah, when it when it uh, is the right the time, right time. And we got to have that ride, and um, yeah, it was pretty cool, man. So yeah, thanks once again no, for right. for the help. Everyone will see that content uh, coming out here pretty soon. Oh, fuck! Before you go, yeah, how bad are you gonna smoke Jack Miller at the band? Oh, Jack! I forgot to ask you, Jack. You've got it coming for you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> You gonna, nah. you gonna tell him <laughs> it's gonna be good to ride against him actually to it'll be good for a lot of the Aus australian superbike riders for them to come across to race a gp rider i mean um he's riding one of the desmo sport ducati pikes and yeah it's gonna be cool it's gonna be real cool what are the expectations i just want to win at the pin. i want to yeah. win my last uh race in the aspk for a while which would be cool if i can um i love the bend it's such a cool track it's such a good atmosphere and um, with Jack there, we should have a good crowd as well as the ASBK. And um, yeah, it'll be good for one last send off. Do you, what, what, so how do you think he, like, is it harder for him to come over here than what he thinks? Or is it, you know what I mean? Like, is it, do you think it would be hard to go from riding a MotoGP bike and doing that whole program to then coming and racing locally? Like, he hasn't raced here in in so long yeah. like is it a massive change to, to do I don't think so because he does test the mm. I don't know if he tests a V4S or a V4R yeah overseas, I know he's got one of those bad yeah, boys yeah he's got though. one of them and um, yeah he's always just going going testing on it so the only thing that he's going to have to learn over here is um, the the track which it's a new track that not a lot of even the ASBK guys they haven't done a lot of testing there so um, it's going to be interesting not like none of the ASBK guys have pretty much ridden there in two years except for a couple of them so it's gonna be interesting and and do you think that like is there any confidence to be gained on your end like let's say you can beat jack um at the race does that then give you extra confidence or do you already think that you're 
like are you good you're like all right yeah i can do this i can ride these bikes and on my on my day on the same bike same track i can be as good as anyone i'm pretty confident in myself but i think um the main thing if i did beat jack would show a lot of the people that it's once again it's not just a name yeah um it'd be cool it'd be cool to beat jack it'd be cool to beat everyone there um so hopefully i can have a win there and win the round would be great just for one last send off and it'd be just do my mindset good i think if i did have a win there yeah yeah definitely yeah well ollie bayless you're a legend appreciate Thank you, you mate december 3rd 4th and 5th yeah uh ollie will be racing at the bend in south australia the gypsy gang will be there we'll be cheering you on we'll also be cheering on jack uh we got hookies racing it it's gonna be good and billy's racing it yeah so we got all the boys are coming out all the boys are out yeah so and i'm only gonna be going past i mean they're gonna be going to that race meeting with one motto i just better get it out really quick (laughs) <laughs> if you're not if you're first, not you're first, last, you're last. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. All right, everyone, we will uh we'll see you at the bend. Thanks Sweet. Ollie for coming on. Thanks Appreciate for it, me. mate. Cheers. And uh yeah, get your backside track side. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, nice. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. And to listen to the full three-hour podcast, search Gypsy Tales in your favorite podcast platform or click the link in the description below. Gypsy Gang.